right. Well, if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to open it up. John chapter 15. John chapter 15 is where we're going to be. Um, we're in the middle of a series called Deeper. What does it look like for us to go deeper in our faith, deeper in our walk with, with Jesus? And I, and I want to ask you a question this morning. What step can you take today to go deeper? What is one thing that you can begin doing today that will draw you closer in your walk with the Lord, that will deepen your faith? I think, I think sometimes we overcomplicate spiritual maturity. I think we, it, it seems kind of like this lofty goal that's way off in the future. But you know, uh, it begins with a step. And so what is the one thing that you can do? Maybe for you, the step that you can take today is to find a little bit more consistency in your prayer life. I think most of us would admit we can be more consistent when it comes to praying. Maybe that's the step you take. Maybe the step that you need to take today is to actually pick this thing up and open it and read it. Maybe that's the step. You can do that, right? Most, most homes in our country have anywhere between five and seven Bibles in them. A step that you can take is to pick one of those up, open it up, and begin reading it. Maybe a step that you can take is maybe you've got some worry, you've got some fear, you've got uh, some sort of hang-up that is holding you back from experiencing what God has for you. Maybe today the step that you'll take is to trust the Lord with whatever that is. And to truly believe in your heart of hearts that He is in control of all things. Maybe the step that you can take today to grow deeper is to confess some sin. Maybe you've got some secrets. Maybe you've got some things that you've kept hidden that are in the dark. And maybe today the step you take is to bring those things into the light and confess and repent. What's the step you need to take? You know, this series really is about change. Um, do you believe change is possible? Do you believe that? Do you believe that anyone can change? And I'm not talking about temporary change. I'm talking about lasting, deep change. you believe that? you believe anyone can change? Look at your neighbor and say, anyone can change. It's a little interactive. You guys are freaking out. Like, oh my gosh. You can talk. It's all right. Anyone can change. And that means you. Sometimes this is a hard one for us to get. We're not really sure we, we're actually capable of changing. Or maybe you know somebody in your life and like, man, I don't know if that dude's ever going to change. But there's a better way to say that. Anyone can be changed. Anyone can be changed. I won't make you say that to your neighbor. But that's the reality, right? That the only thing that can ever produce long-lasting change is when our hearts change. And the only thing that can do that is the Gospel of Jesus. Religion's not going to change you. Having a list of all the right things to do, that's not going to change you. Those are good. But that's not going to change your heart. The Gospel is what changes your heart. And so that's really what John 15 is all about. How are we able to change? Is it even possible for us to change? Well, John 15 is going to show us how we can do that today. Before we do that, um, when we're talking about change, when we're talking about heart change, we're talking about anyone can be changed by the gospel. We need to be reminded of what the gospel is. All right? Um, the gospel is the only way to be changed. Um, the gospel is not about changing your behaviors. The, the gospel is not about um, a bunch of prescribed religious duties. The gospel is about a personal relationship with the living God. And that invitation to receive the gospel is open to each and every one of us. But the reality is all of us have a condition. All of us have a problem, and it's called sin. All of us, we have a bent to rebel, to disobey God. We are cursed with sin. Psalm 51 says that at the moment that you were conceived, you were a sinner. 
So before you ever took a breath, before you ever made a wrong decision or a right decision, the Bible says that we are all sinners. And because of that, we've fallen short of God's glorious standard. But the good news, the gospel is good news. The good news of that is that the Lord in His love for us didn't leave us that way. He made a way for us and He sends His one and only Son, Jesus, to come and to live perfectly and to die, not just for you, but in your place. And He gave His life to make a better way. Three days later, He's raised from the dead. Forty days later, He ascends to heaven. He sends the Holy Spirit to indwell us as believers. And now as believers, as followers of Jesus, we are capable of making changes. We're capable of taking steps into a deeper faith of Jesus because of the Holy Spirit in our life. And these steps, getting deeper, is a fruit of the Spirit in our life. And so just remind ourselves the gospel is not just for lost people. The gospel is for you and I today. And I think sometimes we get that a little mixed up. We think the gospel is for unsaved people. The gospel is for me when I said a prayer when I was nine years old, and I've kind of graduated past that. But that's just not true. I said a while back that a lot of people think that the gospel is the diving board into religion. It's kind of our initiation into Christianity. But that's not true. The gospel is the pool. And as we swim in the gospel, as we uh, just have the gratitude that we've been saved, that, that Jesus has loved us so much that he gave his life for us, that his Holy Spirit fills us, when we live with that gratitude, our response is to go deeper, to abide, as we're going to look at today. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at how we can change. We're going to read uh, John 15, 1 through 11, and then we're going to kind of walk through it a little bit. All right? I'm using the New King James translation this morning. This is what it says. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, He prunes, that it may bear even more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gathered them and they throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, I also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we, we believe that it's alive. Lord, that it's not just a book, but that you have something for us today. And so, Lord, I pray you'd use me to teach the word accurately. God, I pray that you would give us all understanding to, to receive what you have for us today. Lord, soften our hearts, open our eyes today for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So, verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine. This is the final of Jesus' I am statements. All throughout the Gospel of John, he's using these metaphors, these word pictures uh, to describe himself. And this is the last one. I am the true vine. Up to this point, he said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the narrow gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And here in chapter 15, I am the true vine. Jesus was a brilliant teacher. And he would use these metaphors, these word pictures, to connect to his audience in a powerful way. But when I read, I am the true vine, it's a little bit weird. Like, I, I don't really understand that. 
I'm not, I'm not a gardener. I'm not familiar with how vines work and all that. Um, but his listeners would have. They would have understood because vineyards were familiar. They saw them. They were a familiar sight for them. But even bigger than that, they would have known that in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was referred to as the vine. These were God's chosen people. These were uh, the people that God cared for and nurtured. And these are the people that God expected to bear fruit. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. It'll be up on the screen. This is what it says. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. Look at how he cares for it. He dug it up and he cleared out its stones and he planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst. He also made a wine press in it. And so he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. And he looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. So the, vi- the vineyard was the nation of Israel that God cared for, that He planted. He pulled out of Egypt and He planted them, expecting good fruit. But yet, we know the nation of Israel constantly lived in rebellion. They constantly chose other things. They constantly wandered. They constantly chose idolatry. And because of that, God removed His protection from them. But Psalm chapter 80, again, points to this metaphor of a vineyard in the nation of Israel. And this is what it says. This, this is hope right here. This is a pointer to Jesus. All right? Return, we beseech you, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see and visit this vine and the vineyard which your right hand has planted and the branch that you made strong for yourself. It is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your, here's the hope right here. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man whom you made strong for yourself. Then we will not turn back from you. Revive us, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Cause your face to shine, and we shall be saved. See, the hope in the psalm is Jesus. Israel didn't produce. And so Jesus, in John chapter 15, says, I am the true vine. Jesus is the obedient vine. Jesus was the vine that God would produce the fruit that He intended through Christ perfectly. He is the true vine. Isn't that cool? I mean, that makes a whole lot more sense to me now. He is the true vine, and His Father is the gardener. Look at verse 2. Jesus says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear even more fruit. So he's describing two different kinds of branches here. The first branch, it's it's important that both of these branches we know are in Christ. So he's talking about believers here. Okay, Two branches that are in him. One doesn't bear fruit and says he takes it away. He takes it away. Now, when I read that, you're like, that's kind of scary. What does that mean, he takes it away? Does that mean if I'm in Christ and I don't bear fruit, that he's going to take away my salvation? Well, we don't believe the Bible teaches that. We don't believe that the Bible teaches if you are in Christ that anything can ever change that. Nothing can ever take that away. That's the gospel. That's the good news. 
And we know that by scriptures like John chapter 10, where Jesus says this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them what? What does it say? Eternal life. What does eternal mean? Forever, right? So if you could lose it, then it wasn't eternal. It means God just lied. It's eternal. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So Jesus is talking about believers here. He's not talking about taking them away and them losing their salvation. And so this verse kind of tripped me out a little bit. So I dug a little bit. You know what that phrase takes away? It's better translated, lift it up. If you are a believer this morning and your life is not producing fruit, this is not a picture of an angry garden, gardener just lopping off branches. This is a picture of a loving father lifting up the branch to put you in a better position to grow. A guy, after the first service, a guy came up to me and he said, you know, um, my dad used to plant tomatoes and he'd have a lot of tomato plants. And um, when the tomato would get about this tall, it would produce, anyone do tomatoes? All right, good. So nobody can correct me after this. Great. All right. Uh, But he said when the tomato plant would get about this big, it would produce its first bulb. But when it got that tall, it usually had these uh, things he called suckers that would be about 8 to 10 inches coming out of the plant. And he called them suckers because they would suck away the nutrients from the bulb. And the objective was to get the bulb to produce, right? And so what they would do is they would cut off these suckers and replant them. And then they would grow and produce the bulb. And he said, you know, it's kind of like a picture of of John 15 too. He doesn't lop us off and disregard us. He lifts us up so that we can produce, so that we can better produce the fruit that he desires for us. Look again at verse 2. Look at the other branch. So again, this is another branch who is in Christ that bears fruit, He prunes it that it may bear more fruit. He cuts it back. If you're a gardener, you know, uh, for your plant to really produce, you've got to cut it back. Like if I had a rose bush, I've never planted a rose bush in my life. But if I did, I would have to cut it back so that it would really grow into what it was created to be. A big, beautiful rose bush. But if you don't cut back a rose bush, it will grow into itself. It will suck away the nutrients. It will choke itself out. It will block itself from the sunlight, and eventually it will die. And if it doesn't die, it will produce these little tiny, uh, weak little flowers. And so the gardener cuts it back. They prune it back so that it can be exposed to the sunlight and then really flourish and grow. And that's what God does with us, isn't it? He prunes things out of our life. He, he cuts us back. The things that are maybe a distraction or the things that uh, maybe you're giving more attention to or, or maybe idols in your life that you're chasing after or maybe a relationship in your life that, that is just a, is way too much of a priority. Maybe God would prune those things out of your life. Or maybe it's resources. Maybe God uses a job loss to prune you, to teach you to trust in Him and not in your money. We know that God uses discipline. When we have sin in our life, He disciplines us because He loves us. And He uses that to prune us, to correct us, to shape us. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. Sorry, Hebrews chapter 12. Starting in verse 5, it says, Have you forgotten the encouraging words that God spoke to you as His children? And He said, My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline, and don't give up when He corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those that He loves, and He punishes each one He accepts as His child. As you endure this, <clears throat> as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as His own children. 
Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and you're not really his children at all. And since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the very best that they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. See the growth? No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. He uses discipline, doesn't he? Some of us, we've experienced that. He also uses our suffering. He doesn't cause it, but he uses it. And some of you I know in this room, you've experienced some tremendous suffering. You've experienced loss, You've experienced pain. And you would be able to stand up in this room today and you would be able to testify of the faithfulness and the goodness of God. That through the darkest moments of your life, God was faithful and He carried you through it. And He's carrying you through it today. And you've experienced a closeness to the Lord that as many people will never experience. He uses our suffering. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Going through some suffering, it's going to use it to prune you so that your endurance will grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Have you ever seen a plant after it's been pruned? It looks all kinds of messed up, doesn't it? It's pretty rough. Pruning is painful. Sometimes pruning doesn't make any sense, but we trust the Lord. We trust the gardener. Give it some time. It'll begin to grow again. It'll begin to heal It'll begin to flourish. It'll begin begin to become something that it was created to be. Verses 3 and 4. It says, You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5 says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. I cut off this branch off of uh, one of our shrubs at the house. And, uh, you know, it still looks pretty good. I cut it off yesterday. It's amazing that it's still green. um, But, you know, in a few days, um, the little limbs will begin to get weaker, the Nice green leaves will begin to turn brown and they will fall off. And I think the sad reality for so many of us is this is how we live. No power, no joy, no purpose, no fruit. Because we're no longer connected to the life source. We're no longer connected to the vine. And so in this series, Deeper, would you say that you have a deeper walk with Jesus today than you did a year ago? Would you say that your faith is deeper today than it was a month ago, a week ago, yesterday? My fear is that for so many of us, this is what we do. This is how we live. And we attempt to hang little fake fruit on our branch. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to hang that fruit right there just so everyone thinks that I'm okay. Or I'm going to, I'm going to pretend that I got joy. I'm going to smile. But the reality is I'm dead inside. I'm not abiding in Christ anymore. 
And I'm just faking it. Eventually, it will catch up to you. Eventually, your branch will wither and it will die. It says, abide in me and I will abide in you. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus talked about um, people who claimed Jesus but really weren't His. They claimed to be attached to the true vine. They claimed to be a branch, but the reality was they were never His. And so all they did was hang fake fruit. Jesus, we've done this in Your name, and we've done this in Your name, and we've done this in Your name. But at the end of the day, you remember what Jesus said to him? He said, depart from me. I never knew you. You were never in Christ. You were never connected to the vine. This is just about religion. Listen, Christianity is not about religion. It's not about behavior modification. It's not about faking it. Christianity is about abiding in the love of Christ. Abiding in the vine. And you don't produce fruit. The vine produces the fruit through your life. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out. That word cast out is different than the word takes away. And so here Jesus is talking about people who are never in the vine. These weren't believers who are not anymore. These were sheep that were never His. Alright? If anyone does not abide in Me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and they throw them into the fire and they are burned. You've got to evaluate, am I in Christ? Am I a believer in Jesus? Not just in my head, but has it changed my life? Is it changing my life? I don't want to walk into eternity just hanging on to some mental knowledge of who Jesus was. That ain't going to work, guys. Has the gospel taken root in your life? Has it changed you? Is it changing you? Is your life bearing fruit? Has it ever bared fruit? Do you have a conviction, a hatred over your sin? Do you have a desire to follow the Lord? If none of those things are true for you, you better evaluate. Am I really His? Am I really a believer? Am I really a follower of Jesus? Am I really saved or not? Verse 7 If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. This is very interesting, isn't it? One of the uh, benefits of abiding, of remaining in Christ, of resting in His love for you, is answered prayer. You feel like your prayers are never answered? You feel like your prayers just bounce off the ceiling? Are you abiding in Christ? Because when you do, when you delight yourself in the Lord, He'll give you the desires of your heart. Why? Because when you delight yourself in the Lord, your desires aren't selfish. When you delight yourself in the Lord, your desires are His desires. And He's happy to answer those prayers when they line up with His will. Verse 8, By this my Father is glorified that you would bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. Verse 9, I love this verse. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Think about that. That is, that is an astounding statement for Jesus to make. Just as the Father has loved the Son, that's how much the Son loves us. And God loved the Son perfectly and completely and that's how Jesus, in turn, loves us. Think about your kids. I see a lot of kids in here. Think about moms and dads. Think about how much you love your kid. I would do anything for my girls. 
But my love for my girls pales in comparison to the love that Christ has for us. It doesn't even come close. And Jesus says, you know what? Rest in that. Abide in that. Do you know how much you're loved? Do you know how much you're cherished? That God would know the darkest parts of you and love you anyway? Abiding in Christ is not so much about the things that you do for him as it is about resting in his thoughts about you. Let me say that again. Abiding in Christ is not so much about um, what you do for him as it is as resting in his thoughts about you. Do you do that? Do you just rest in that reality that you are loved by the creator of the world? And listen, when you recognize how much you're loved, you live your life different. When you recognize how much you're loved by God, you, you walk with gratitude. And every fruit that is produced out of your life is just in response to the gratitude that you have. I think this is a hard thing for us. Because we want to base our acceptance on our performance. The more I behave, the better I behave, the more things I do right, the more I'm going to be loved by God. The more I'm going to be accepted, the better Christian I will be. This is a hard thing to grasp that that your righteousness is not based on your performance, but it's based on Jesus' performance on your behalf. So I don't, I don't try to produce fruit. I don't try to live a godly life so that I will be more accepted. I live a godly, Christ-honoring life because I already am accepted. And I don't do all these things so that God would love me more. I do all these things because I'm already loved. And that's when you change. When you get that, that's when you get deeper. When you understand that, listen, we're going to swim in the gospel every day. We're going to abide in the love that Christ has for us. That's when true, lasting change comes. That's when you can take these steps of obedience. That's when you can take these steps and grow deeper in your faith. The Holy Spirit begins to produce those changes in you. I read a story recently about a pastor who was counseling a guy, and the guy came in, and he was distraught, and his life was a disaster. He just made a mess of things, and he comes in, he's very, he's crying, he's torn up, and he's got his head in his hands, and he's just saying, Jesus wants me to change. Jesus wants me to change. Jesus wants me to change. And the pastor stands up, and he writes that phrase, Jesus wants me to change, on the board. And he begins to slowly erase and rearrange words to where it says, no longer Jesus wants me to change, but instead it says, Jesus wants to change me. When we're talking about change, I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about you trying harder. This branch can't try any harder to produce anything. It can't do it. You can't try harder and all of a sudden produce fruit. No, you abide, and Jesus changes you from the inside out, not the outside in. How do we change? We change by abiding in His love. It's not about behavior modification. It's about changing from the inside out, not the outside in. Abiding in Christ means that I live in a realization and an acceptance of my helplessness. It means that I need Jesus every day. It means that I need the gospel every day. Abiding in Christ means that I am seeking after the Lord, that I long for His presence in my life, that I long for His power in my life. Abiding in Jesus means that I'm crucifying my sin every day. 
Abiding in Christ means that I welcome the process of God's pruning in my life. I may not like it, but I know it's for my good. Abiding in Christ means that I'm going to give Him all the glory for any fruit that comes from my life. Anything that God chooses to do in and through me, I'm going to give Him the glory. I'm not going to somehow pat myself on the back for all the good things that I'm doing. No, I'm going to deflect that back to the Lord where the glory belongs. You want to grow deeper? Abide. You want to experience true change? Abide. Real change begins not with you being told what to do for God, but believing in what God has already done for you. Look at verses 10 and 11 and I'm done. If you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. You know what the fruit of abiding is? Obedience and joy. Obedience and joy. This is a glove. It's a work glove. And who, whoever created this glove designed it to do some work. This was going to be utilized to carry out some tasks. It was going to be a work glove. But if I set this work glove right here and step back and tell it what it was created to do, is it ever going to do it? All right, go ahead. It's not capable. It's not capable of doing anything that it was designed and created to do. Why? Because it has no life in it. It has no spiritual life in it. Just like us, apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. You have no spiritual life in you at all. And so what do we do? We abide in Christ. And His Spirit comes and He fills us up. And He works in and through our life. And then we can begin to do good works. Then we can begin to bear spiritual fruit. Then we can begin to do things in this life that really matter in eternity. In response to the love that God has for us, now we're going to be obedient. And now this love can fulfill the purposes that it was created to do. Because it's filled with Christ. It's remaining in Christ. You want to change? Abide. Rest in the fact that you are loved. It's not about religion. It's about a relationship with Jesus that's available for you. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. Right now you're a branch that's going to be cast out and burned up one day. That's a reality. Because you are not in Christ. You are not His. Let me tell you something. He loves you. You've not out the grace of God. You're not too far gone. Anyone can change. All it takes is for you is to surrender and to come to Jesus and say, I'm a sinner. I want to confess. I want to repent. I want to turn to Jesus. I want to turn away from my sin. I want to turn to Jesus. Would you save me? Would you forgive my sin? That invitation is available for you. You can become in Christ. Not because of anything good you've done, but because of what Jesus has done for you. That invitation is for you. And in just a few minutes, we're going to sing a song. That invitation is for you, and it's open for you. And if you don't know Jesus, man, I beg you, give Him your life and experience the joy and the peace and the purpose like no other. Christian, if you're here this morning and you kind of wonder why all your other Christian friends are outpacing you, you seem so much more mature than me. Maybe you're not connected. Maybe you need to rest in the love that the Father has for you. Maybe you need to plug back into that power and that presence in your life. Maybe you've been doing things just merely out of routine and habit and religion. Maybe you need to come and confess 
and repent and abide. What's that step you're going to take today? It's the one thing that you can do today to grow deeper with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Lord, thank you for your church. Thank you for your word. Lord, help us. We want to abide in you. Lord, we, we know that apart from you, we can do nothing. Lord, it's silly for us to even try to do things without your power in our life. Lord, help us to trust you. Help us to keep our eyes on you. Lord, help us to trust you through any pruning process that you're doing in our life. Though it's painful, we believe that you're good and you're for our good. And so, Lord, help us to trust you in that process. Lord, if there's any sin or habit or hang up in our life right now that is holding us back, Lord, we pray that you would show it to us. Lord, that you would take it away from us so that we can bear the fruit that you desired for us to produce. Lord, in this time of invitation, Lord, I pray if there's someone that doesn't know you that today they would stop running, stop playing games, stop trying to play religion. But Lord, today would be the day that they would enter into a personal growing relationship with you. Lord, I pray that this is not a closing song where we're packing up our stuff and we're thinking about lunch. Lord, forgive us. Lord, we want this time to be a time where we respond. Lord, where you move us to change. We love you and pray it in the name of Christ. Amen.